Well, thanks for that great uh, setup, Lisa. Good morning, everyone, and, and three cheers to all of you for joining us, whether it's 7 a.m. or 10 a.m. where you are. I, I'm so glad you, you've made this a priority in your schedule to block out this hour. Um, I am thrilled that Michael Mata, Dr. Michael Mata, is joining us for this phone call. I got to know Michael, oh, probably seven, eight, ten years ago, um, but I had heard about him long before that. And in particular, I had heard about his work on the topic that we're doing today, which is uh, exegeting or understanding, studying your community. So Michael is the Urban Development Director for World Vision Domestic Programs here in the U.S. So. Part of why we had to do the, the call this early in the morning is because Michael's traveling so much that this was the best time for him. Um, he, in, in that role, he's committed to strengthening the capacity of community leaders and faith-based organizations. He teaches adjunct at the Claremont School of Theology here in Los Angeles, and he's also an adjunct faculty member at Fuller Seminary. He is, uh, one of his roles at Fuller is, is he's one of our uh, professors in our Urban Youth Ministry Certificate Program. He teaches a class on transformational urban youth ministry. And I get to read some of the papers from students in that class. And truly, his experience with, or their experience with him is transformative. So, um, so Michael is going to talk for 10, 15 minutes or so just to set the stage. Um, and, then, and then we'll dive into to Q&A. And as Lisa's already mentioned, your questions will make this such a better, um, better experience. So please be jotting down or making notes of questions you want to ask, Michael, and, and I can field those. Probably the best way is by chat, but, um, but if that's not possible for you, we can do that by phone. So, so Michael, please help us understand more of your passion for entering the community, um, looking for hope, looking for scraps of life, et cetera. Well, it really began with my work. Excuse me. Gonna, do I move over to host? You I just did it for you. Thank you. You're um, welcome. Began when I when I was actually full time in, in, in urban youth ministry. Um, I quickly realized that if I were to reach out and make an impact in the lives of the young people, I really needed to understand the context in which in which they were living, going to school, socializing, those very few guys and gals at that time who actually had a job. And so um, I also was very um, keen on understanding the, you know, what, what was going on in terms of the dynamics. And I tended to look at demographic information studies that have been done by the city, uh, United Way, academic institutions, but the data seemed to be um, you know, dated. It, it was already a few years old, uh, depending upon census information. Um, and if most of us in the urban context know that it's a very transitory community at times, um, I didn't have the right information. It just didn't give me or, or, or help me understand and um, what was going on in the lives of the young people. So I needed to go out uh, and, and not just drive through the community, but actually spend time in the community. And, it, you know, a lot of us do that. You know, one-on-one, a couple of people, we go out and have chat, but really take a, an active interest in what was going on in the city. Now, that's what my intent was. I didn't know how to do that. I, I, you know, other than I look at the building, it's big, it's, oh, this is a dirty place, um, on, 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 and on. It wasn't until I went back to uh, school in urban planning and uh, realized there was a real great tool there, uh, field observation, that could really help us. And in my background, one of my degrees is in biblical literature, and I exegete biblical texts. So I put the two together that the urban environment is like a text. It's telling us a story. The story of this past, the struggles and challenges that the communities are facing now, and, and even a glimpse into the future. Um, and so that's what really got me involved. Now I could, when I came back from that time away in Berkeley, um, I was able then to maybe fully understand or better understand what was going on in the community, um, spending time and invi inviting the young people to join me in that process. Great. Well, um, can you, Amy, we have in front of us uh, the handout, Entering the Community, Take Your Time. Um, perhaps walk us through that or help us maybe tell some stories of times where you have actually entered the community and, and, and done this process. Well, what you have there is just a synopsis of the workshop I do that's much more intensive and goes into more detail and various elements of it. Um, 
actually, I walk in communities a lot. <laughs> uh, just this yeah. Monday, I was in um, around the medical center in L.A. Uh, usually when I am traveling, it's because I'm doing the same thing, not only in the United States, but around the world. So it really gives me a chance to understand and apply um, these, these techniques or principles. And, um, you know, they still are very uh, apropos no matter what context, urban context you're in. Um, but I do, I do what I, I, I say there. I, I walk in the community. I look at the structures. I look at the way space is being used. Um, I, I see how people, because the city is elastic. It's not a monolithic construct. Um, people are always working at making the built environment reflect themselves, their values, their hopes and dreams. And so I'm always looking for that. Um, nowadays it's very, um, you know, in to, to be environmentally concerned, you know, build, you know, having your gardens. Well, many of our immigrant populations have always doing, done that, um, you know, gardens in the back and the front yard. Well, now we have community gardens. So I look for those kinds of elements where there are signs of hope because I started out doing this honestly looking at all the needs. And the needs can be very overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and we're not going to be able to address all of those. But if we also look at signs of hope where God is working, where those aspects of life are, are flourishing or attempting to flourish, then it helps me better under, to, to link up or support or nurture those and possibly find partners in, in, in that will help me make life better in some way or fashion for the young people and their families. So uh, I, I reach graffiti and in fact a couple of weeks ago we had graffiti in our own community and our neighbors were calling us, us up and saying hey you know there's some gangs in the community what are we going to do about it well the reality was there weren't gang graffiti you know um, and we were able to substantiate that by calling the police and it was a you know, tagging crew well that's a whole different kind of dynamic than if it was a gang in the neighborhood then we would have taken a different kind of action for that so I, I, I'm always keen on this um, looking and seeing, again, what's the story um, that the built environment is telling me about the people who live there. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, I've, I've, I've done this sort of walk, and so I can imagine, in fact, I just did it a couple of weeks ago with folks from my church here in Pasadena, so, so I can imagine. But I, I'm, I'm wondering if you can think back to, you know, what you did earlier this week or recently and, and take us down the process of walking down a block um, or two. I mean, you've kind of alluded to it with buildings, et cetera, but, you know, I, I know that, that trees and even the, the type of plants are gro that are growing are something that you look at, cars, et cetera. But, but just if you can imagine walking down the block with us, um, if you could take a few minutes and just help us understand even more specifically some of the things that, that, that you would want to point out to us, either as needs or signs of hope. Well, like I said, it's part of a larger network. Uh, workshop, and I'll be happy to do that workshop because I begin to lay out the theory of change, the theories that's um, that are implicit in these principles when I walk through a community. Um, I really quickly look at the space, how space is being used. Um, is, is it really, it, it does, you know, all buildings and, and even neighborhoods have manners. Part of it is visceral because I want to, am I welcome here? Does the space allow people to walk the streets, or are there places where people can to congregate, or are the sidewalks narrow and that you can't do that? Then it's you know the the car is king, and so then when it tells me this is a a mobile community, then then what's going on there? Now vehicles are very interesting. You brought that up uh, because um, vehicles don't always relate to or or or, or um, resonate with where people are financially. Uh, cars are symbols of status, sometimes of power, or aspirations of their lives or where they want to be. So my neighbor across the street, one-bedroom apartment, I know there's about more than two people that live there. Uh, it's a family, um, and they have a really nice car. Well, that's where they put their investment of something that's, that they nurture and, you know, care for and, and gives them some kind of status over and above their own challenges in their lives. Structures, as you see right there, are really about, do people live here? Um, is it a multi-unit you know, complex, or is it a, a house that has been subdivided? If it's been subdivided, then, then it tells me then the people, you know, there's more than one family there, and they're trying to make ends meet, and usually because uh, we spend about 30% of our income towards housing, or that's the theory, uh, here in L.A., 50% towards our 
towards housing. <laughs> and you can have a kind of a sense of what the economic levels look like. Scraps of life, um, you know, what people leave around. You know, if we were to go to visit your house uh, this morning, Kara, uh, you would probably say, well, give, it, give me a few minutes. I'm going to clean up the room and, <laughs> oh, you know, and then uh, we'll sit down in the living room. But right away, by sitting down there waiting for the, the water and tea that you're going to bring us, um, the, the, the color scheme, uh, the things that your daughters have left around on the floor or on the yeah. table, uh, the pictures, uh, all those tell us quite a bit about you, what's important to you, yeah. what's important to your family, your children. And so that's what we do in the built environment. We be begin to look at those kinds of, of, of clues, if you will, in the story, but that our people may feel like it's about them, but they really are communicating somebody, something to the ones who's reading the story. Signage is really important, um, but signage in a different way, not like lettering or something literal, but what are the signs that people put up? Um, it could be a symbol. Uh, you know, a lot of people are really religious around my community, and there's a crucifix. Um, there's actually a menorah uh, of politically where they, they fit in the spectrum of, you know, of, of politics, um, the kinds of placards and who's voting for whom and what, what proposition. Tells me quite a bit. Billboards, you know, what is, what, is, what is the product or the service that's being promoted? Because marketeers are reaching, trying to reach a demographic. So are they selling nice uh, Subarus or are they going to be a Lexus? Or are they telling me where to get a WIC application? Quite a bit is right there. And most billboards will tell you the ethnicity, the social economic level, um, the household size or the type of households. You know, you go to West Hollywood here in Los Angeles and it's going to be a very, um, um, you know, uh, billboards and advertisement geared towards the, the gay lesbian community. Um, and those are the kind of things I'm going to look at. That's and then I put those together. Now, I don't do this by myself. Yeah. I'm always having somebody with me because, you know, that's the way you can definitely do Bible study on your own, but when you get it in a group of people, we really get to um, unpack what's there. And, and I don't pretend to know everything. Uh, I may be 85% on target, but that 15%, I need some help to understand. And more importantly, it allows me then to go to people in the community that, hey, I spend time in your community. This is what I hear. This is what I yeah. see. This is what I yeah. smell. Tell me, I, 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 don't, I don't get this vacant space or that weird smell I hear, you know, I, have, I, 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 I pick up in this community. Tell me more about that. Now it gives me a kind of a credibility because I'm actually demonstrating I care about their neighborhood. I'm understanding and seeking to understand. Um, and always be careful not to judge. I may not like the color of the building or the house, but that color is telling me something about the people themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, those are the things I look at. That's great. Th thanks, Michael, for helping us, us imagine what it's like to walk the street with you. Um, somebody asked a question. I'm going to scroll up. I thought it was a great question. Seth asked, he said, sometimes it is more natural to see need instead of hope. Um, you know, our eyes are, are often trained to look around and see problems instead of possibilities. So, yes. Michael, how, how can you help us train our eyes to focus more on signs of hope than signs of need? Well, very good question. Um, I, again, I admit, I was uh, really driven by a needs-based understanding of ministry. And so there was no <laughs> no uh, end to the kinds of needs and problems and challenges, especially in marginal communities in which many of us work and minister. Um, and there's no way we can respond. Um, and I, I, that time was, it was almost was paralytic in, in, in trying to understand my role in all this. So I was, you know, paralyzed by the analysis I was doing. But I, I, I came, you know, aware of a different approach, and it's really informed what I do now in round community transformation. That was being an asset-based or asset-oriented, um, looking for the strengths and possibilities, because there I can enhance or build upon that. Now it gave me a sense of hope. And so nowadays I look for where there are gifts, resources, assets in the community, and most if not all communities have the ability, some strengths and all that. Now, it means I have to translate it in a different way. I need to value the people themselves. So Ray Ray or Chewy on the corner who's hustling, you know, they have some inherent skills and abilities. Yeah. And you can't take it to the bank, 
but he knows how to manage a, a, a marketing crew, right? He knows how to promote a product. He does a little bit of community relations. He knows how to handle funding and money and finances and pay his crew and whatever, but, you know, he can't just go into a, a job right away. Well, I want to look at that saying he has some assets that need to be nurtured and cultivated. Now, it, it's not always in my image. It's, we're looking for insight from God and, and prayer to guide us. Um, there's a park or a ba an abandoned lot. That's an asset. It's, basic, it's vacant. It's not being used, but perhaps can we see it as a possible community garden or some a other activity happening there? Uh, one day I was driving through uh, Hollywood, and I want to take a, a shortcut. In the middle of the street were these men playing dominoes. Now, that was a nuisance and intrusion on my ability to you know, transverse that neighborhood. But I, look, I looked at that as a sign of hope that even though they didn't have space in their apartment complex, they were claiming public space and transforming it into social space. And that was an important thing. That wasn't a problem. It was something that they were taking control of. I saw that as an asset and the strength of the community. Now, even this on graffiti around um, gangs, you know, that's a strong sense of identity. Um, I see that. Certainly lack of options and opportunities, but you know, many times I've had to negotiate with them in order to do something else, and they've been very open to that. Now, that's a sense of power, not always directed positively, but if we begin to look at it as something that we can leverage, uh, a little jujutsu about how we could take that, something that's negative, and to make it a positive, then we can do a lot more, or at least be able to be part of something positive and have movement rather than always being reactive. I also want to look at the future of a community, and so I'm, that helps me to be proactive because I have to admit most of our ministries are reactive. We're reacting against some problems. We're reacting against some issues and not really getting at the very root of what's going on in the neighborhood. Yeah. You know, I, there's a couple of good questions that have come in on the chat, but before we get to those, I, I'd love for you to unpack what you just said because those last few sentences are pretty powerful, that we tend to be more reactive than proactive in our neighborhoods. Can, can you give some examples of, of ministries you know uh, that are being proactive, that are doing the type of community asset-based transformation that, that you're nudging us towards or, or, uh, or, or pulling us towards? You know, I wish I could name those, <laughs> yeah. where they're being proactive. It happens to be more seen in the, and I, I'm sure they exist, um, more around our secular communities where they come into a neighborhood and begin, from the get-go, identify the strengths and assets, as opposed to coming in, you know, I know a grant wants, you know, a grant or a proposal. We have to tell how bad it is and to get money, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, I've seen more saying, you know, an, an example right now, and not, not, not to toot our own horn, around uh, World Vision's work in MacArthur Park, 40,000 people, one square mile. Kara, I think you're familiar with that neighborhood. Of course. 90% yeah. um, immigrant, um, two-thirds of the children under 18 living in poverty, only a 30% um, graduation rate from high school. This neighborhood is saturated with nonprofits. Um, two major hospitals, uh, advocacy groups, two major uh, youth programs that that are faith-based and, and together service 4,000 young people a year. And guess what? It's, it, it hasn't been better because no one has seen those as assets to work together. That's the key, yeah. collaborating, working together. Now, all of a sudden, when people find themselves that we can come together build upon each other's strengths, you really center on, you focus on mentoring, you're looking at adjudicated youth, you're looking at, you know, immigrant youth. Well, they all have, they all live in the same neighborhood, so now we're seeing something in a different way that, that they, they themselves can see. But more importantly, it's the young people who are driving this new way of looking and working together. I think one area right now as I talk, uh, where it's happening, they've been proactive around environmental issues, has been in the South Bronx with the Lexi Torres Fleming, that's um, Youth Ministry for Peace and Justice. Um, that's one that I know that has really taken a, 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 you know, this issue by, by the horns and gone forward. And, of course, and Harambe Ministries here in Northwest Pasadena is looking at young people 30 years from now, you know? So that means you have to work on the strength of a community. 
yeah. rather than trying to mitigate the problems all the time. Yeah. You know, um, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the importance of collaboration because we're having a great dialogue on the chat about um, assets that folks are seeing in their communities. And it's, you know, it's ranging from people um, to community centers. Seth posted an art center. Um, Ramin posted social services like community parks and public libraries. Um, Esther posted something interesting. She said that one of the assets is the community of the Spanish-speaking women. They are a tight-knit group who look out for each other and are willing to learn together. They are making piñatas, learning how to use computers, and have organized into a community association. I love that. I Isn't love that it. So, so, Michael, imagine that, that you know, you're in Esther's place. You're in a community where you know this type of a group of women is, is a, an asset, a sign of hope. Um, what would you do as a, a youth leader to try to collaborate or to try to partner team somehow with, with the people um, who exemplify these sorts of assets? Well, right away they bring in an ability, this, this social capital that is being formed here because they know each other, they trust each other, learning from each other. Can you define I'm, social capital? There might be some folks who don't know what you mean. Okay, that, that's the kind of the glue, the networking, the relationships that people bring to their own lives and to uh, achieve something they cannot do by themselves, right? That's one of the best. It's neutral. Gangs have social capital. Churches have social capital. It's how you use those relationships and networks and, ability, and, and inherent resources to do something they cannot accomplish by, as, as an individual. So it's very communal in our understanding. And, and this description of this community and the women working t together, well, then, you know, they're making piñatas. And I'm sure they're bringing in some of the young people involved in that. Um, they're helping each other. Um, but they also bring a lot of um, wisdom and experience that they can, um, you know, share with um, younger people who may not uh, really appreciate it. Um, I, you know, piñatas are fun. They, they're celebratory. You could actually maybe make that into, uh, and they probably are, you know, selling them to raise money. So there's a lot of ways to capitalize on what they're doing. It's, it behooves us, I think, as youth workers, and I still consider myself working with young people, um, as a way to be a, a leverage, an intermediary. And they appreciate, young people appreciate those relationships that open other opportunities for them that they may not have in themselves. Now, we're talking about the social aspects of it, and I still want to go back to the built environment because that's where we function. And so how can we humanize and make the city or communities more human or fostering these kinds of experiences? And that takes a bit of advocacy. And that means that, you know, a lot of our communities have already been planned 30 years down the road. So are we talking to the, the decision makers who are going to have an impact on the quality of life, if not, the, if not the standard of life, of the people who live there. Do we have those kinds of uh, centers? Uh, are the schools multi-purpose in their design? And, are, and the churches we, we worship in, are they a welcoming to all people, or are we just telling them only a certain kinds of people can come in? So those are elements that I think are really important as we're trying to bring a, a holistic understanding of God's truth not, in, not only into the life of an individual, but into the lives of the community. Yeah, and, and you know, you keep saying things, Michael, but I just want to unpack. So, so this is a great conversation. You said holistic, and I, I think that's the first time you've used that word in this, in this, in this webinar. And, and, and I think that's an important word because there might be some folks listening to you or who heard you speak that feel like, Man, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work on the spiritual transformation of kids. Uh, the community center, they do the physical transformation or the emotional. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more about God. I'm more about scripture. I'm more about spiritual transformation, but, which I know is not your philosophy or theology, but, but can you unpack more about why it's important for those of us from a faith-based perspective to think holistically? Well, we know intuitively, and, and, and some of us actually are intentional about knowing that young people are not one-dimensional. Yeah. If not, then, you know, we might wait to look for another job because that's not, you know, young people, all of us are not one-dimensional, you know. So we have a spiritual side of us that it's obviously it's an important element of ourselves and who we are and gives us, I don't know, meaning and purpose. But also we, we have a family, most of us, and we come from families. 
And so that's a different kind of, uh, you know, social reality that informs who we are, actually, gives us the, the first lenses to look at the world and interpret it. Um, we also, some of us have our, our bivocational, so we work uh, in a place that has different values, different perspectives. So we're, we, we need to understand that, that when we, we touch the lives of young people, it's only one portion of who they are in their totality and, and be, in what God has created them to be, their identity, their image of God is there. So, and not all ministries are, are called to do all there is around young people. Maybe we're very effective in, in evangelizing and, and discipleship, um, but, you know, we may be weak in helping this young person get a job. We can go this one child, one person at a time, but what if we begin to be kind of a networker and a broker of relationships and opportunities for young people? I don't need to do job banks. I know where those exist uh, for young yeah. people. Yeah. I can connect with them on that. Actually, they, they have a grant that need, they need to get bodies through their program in order to be viable. So I'm actually bringing an asset to them. Hey, I have a cadre of young people who are looking for a job. How can I connect with that? Um, I'm, you know, interacting with the probation officer. Hey, I'm here available. You need a chaplain. You need somebody to go in because they are, some of them, most, most of them want them out of the system, so-called system. <laughs> so there's ways to really <laughs> begin to impact. It doesn't have to be us, but if we do that together, boy, you know, we can really, really do uh, uh, impact the lives, not just of those that come into our ministry, but the lives of all young people in a given community by helping people connect the dots in that way. Good. You know, and on the chat, folks are really resonating with what you're saying. They're giving examples of the holistic work they're doing, things like Daniel's talking about anger management classes, gang intervention, um, <clears throat> as well as juvenile justice. Darren's talking about making friends with those who provide effective resourcing for youth, especially holistic. Um, Chris, Chris mentioned meeting with different community letters, leaders. <laughs> who are doing work with youth, learning what they're doing, participating in citywide, local university forums and, and communities. Right. Um, you all are, are giving great examples. Yeah. You, you said something, Michael, a few minutes ago, and, and Lisa commented on this on the chat, too, and that is what's the role of the students themselves in this process? You, you, Thank you. You, kind of, you, you, you said youth-directed at one point. Yeah. Uh, so let's circle back to that, and, um, and, and how do we how do we – help students um, develop their own assets, become leaders, while at the same time recognizing that they're 14 or 17 and, and they're not adults. And so, you know, perhaps there are some developmental issues there. So so speak to us about that, please. Well, thank you. I was going to uh, get into that because when I go into a community and begin to read the story, and, as, and I use the lens, depends on my coming into, I could be looking for places we can work, you know, we can pray for or, we're building some community development strategies, but around community youth development, where young people are seen as an asset, as, as a strength, as a gift to the community. They don't want to see where young people are interacting, or if the community itself is youth-friendly. Does it really welcome young people to be part of this community? And I would, would I look for where young people are interacting, or there are places where they can you know, hang out in a safe way. Those are just the fundamentals. So. I, that's what I want to read that. Now, tie it back to young people being an asset and a strength. 13, 14-year-olds, they're already looking at the world. The research has shown most recently they're very concerned about how the world is, is functioning. And frankly, you know, the only ones to blame is us adults because we're the ones that are in charge. We keep telling them we're in charge, and they keep looking at us and saying, why should we listen to you when you have mucked it up? I'm, 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 you know, laundering the language. You're sanitizing it a bit, yes. Yeah, but you get to the point there on that. Well, I, I think it's because we don't value young people that they do have a, a contribution to make at their young age or so-called young age. It's obviously all have to be development appropriate, but I found them very much with their energy, with their tenacity, I don't see young people at risk. I see them all as risk takers, and that's a strength. You've seen, have you ever, we all raised our hands, see these guys and gals skateboarding? 
You know, if their mother or dad saw them, they'd probably pull me, what are you guys doing jumping off the wind, you know, off the car? They are risk takers. That's a strength. That's an ability. You know, now I'm, I'm hobbling around on my knee today. Um, I'm very conscious of where I'm walking, how I'm doing things, you know. But even with their, uh, you know, the guy who just got a, a, uh, a gold medal in, in, in snowboarding, he did a triple flip. I don't know what they call it. You guys know it better than I do. <laughs> uh, he said after the run that won him, he said, if, if I would have thought about it more, I probably wouldn't have done it. I wasn't ready. I had a broken um, rib from a pre previous run. You know, an adult would have said, hey, don't push yourself. Be careful when you go out there. Don't try to make a, a statement. You know, finish the run safely. He didn't do that. He took a risk and did something he didn't do before, and he accomplished it. Now, I won't all, I'm not saying that's the model for everybody, but <laughs> that tells me that they have abilities and tenacity that we need to tap into, and they may actually have, with a little skill building, an insight on how we can resolve certain issues. You know what? Young people want a safer neighborhood. They want a place that's clean up and, and, and aesthetically pleasing. Now, their aesthetics are different than ours, but that's okay. Um, they want a place that they have control over. You know, our young people in, the, in the MacArthur Park want youth centers uh, in alleyways. And so I asked them, why don't you go to the youth centers that are already here? Because so those have been designed for us. We want something that is about us, that we control. Yeah. So we facilitated two summer, summer activity programs that are staffed by young people, that are designed by young people, that are re and, the, and the participants are recruited by young people. The adults are just there to make sure everything's okay. So um, there's a lot of capacity. We just have to sometimes get out of the way, give them the proper uh, nurturing coaching, as well as, and stop telling them what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, love, I love what you're saying, that, that kids themselves can tell the difference between programs that, and, and, and ministries that are designed really for them with with them being involved in the, the whole even design process. So Lisa's asked a great question on chat. You know, we've made a big jump from thinking about the sights, sounds, and structures of the community to our view of students. How are those two connected? Can you help us? You know, we started looking at scraps of life and structures, and now we're talking about youth as assets. Can you connect the dots for us? Oh, please, absolutely. Uh, let me go back to what I want to make sure that, you know, we, when I go in a community, again, is this a youth-friendly friend, environment, you know, or are or, or people afraid of what's going on? Now, I, I may see bars on windows, right? Or I go to a park and it says no skateboarding, no, no, no music, no, no smoking, no having fun, you know? You know, yeah. that's telling me something about how people view young people or how this community is feeling like either they're under siege <coughs> by some activities that are going on, not always by young people. And yeah. most of the time they're not. And it's only a certain number of young people anyway that are involved in some you know, antisocial behavior that's very destructive. Um, but I, the, the built environment is telling me a story. So are there like advertisements for, for young people to do or, or, or intergenerational kinds of activities or projects? Um, so I'm looking at all that those elements in not only the signs, how, how, how safety is being, um, um, you know, acted on, um, what are the policies that we see by, you know, the things that are going on in the built environment that tells me, you know, elderly are not welcome here. Um, there's no place for uh, people who are, uh, you know, or handicapped or, physically challenged to, to, you know, to be mobile, those are all elements that tell me then again about a certain population who's excluded or included yeah. in the built That's environment. Good. That's good. Um, Esther's asked a question. She says, a lot of the youth in our community know that they are only here for a little while until things get better. So they say that they don't care about this community. They want to move. How can we encourage them to love their neighborhood? By us ourselves showing that we love the neighborhood that we're acting to make this a better place for everyone. Um, once they become part of that process of change, cleaning up, 
taking care of going to a senior adult's apartment or their home and doing those kinds of things. My young people, when we started doing it, they were doing, hey, we got a lot of graffiti here that we don't need. So we started, you know, painting it over with some, some public funds and resources. All of a sudden now they see this as their neighborhood, not a place to get out. And too often our ministries in the past and um, has been like, how can I get these young people, you know, in school and college and away from here? Well, I, I really believe that they need to control. They need to own the pond in which they live, and only to do, and to be able to do that, we need to ourselves facilitate those opportunities, tap into other external resources that are needed, and, and bring them in in a nice, uh, you know, kind of uh, coming alongside of. Um, but unless, unless young people, you know, aren't part of the process, they're going to feel disengaged. They're not going to care. They're going to just go to school, go home, do whatever. But, but if they act out, I think, in a, in a way that speaks to how they see the world relating to them. And so if they want to get out, it's because they don't feel like they own it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I really are moving away from giving somebody a fish or teaching them how to fish. We want to be able to help them own the pond. Let's help them understand how can we change even the physicality of where they live into something that honors who they are. Yeah. You know, as, as I love the phrase you've used a number of times, which is understand the story that our, the neighborhood is, is telling us. And um, somebody mentioned on chat that, that probably even our own youth ministry um, offices or rooms, wherever, wherever kids are seeing us, they tell a story, too. I mean, I'm looking around my own office. Um, yeah. It's telling a story. And you alluded yeah. to that in talking about my... Uh, you know, my 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 living room. If you were to walk into my living room this morning while my family is getting ready, what what do you see, and and what do you see in the structures? But, um, so I mean, do you think it's important? Well, what what kind of stories do we want our ministry exactly. spaces to tell? Yes. Um, yes. What are some of the ingredients that you say? Oh, I I just love it when I walk into a ministry space and I see these elements which tell me these nuances of a story. Excellent. Um, you know, let's go back. I make, I make, when I go talk to people in the community about the story I am reading, it's only one set of eyes or the, whoever the team I'm with, we read. And they may not like, they might not like my interpretation. They may correct me. <laughs> they might add to it. Uh, when I talk to young people, I say, what, when they, when they call, when your neighborhood is named, and people talk about their neighborhood. What do they say about it? And usually it's not a positive thing. It's, you know, okay, yeah. we're gang infested or that's where so-and-so kind of people live. Then I tell, challenge them, what, how can we ch what's the story you really want? And sometimes they don't believe this, that they have a capacity to tell a new narrative or, yeah. and, and to be part of a new narrative. And so we really work on those elements of it. And because most ministries have space they control, I invite yeah. those young people to tell me, if you were to redesign this room, um, what would you do? Some, what would you do to it in order for them, for you to feel like this is your space, yeah. that you're safe here, that God wants you here, that, that this is where you find a solace and a real direct connection with God. Um, they can come up with some spaces, um, some design <laughs> issues that may yeah. challenge us. But nonetheless, yeah. at least we talk about that. Yeah. Then I might need to have to say, we're going to need to negotiate this. And that's a great skill to help them negotiate because those are learning uh, life skills that they need as adults uh, to get on and with it. I came back from a conference um, with UNICEF in the fall, and I, I, I gained a better appreciation for play. We've overstructured young people's lives. Um, and, and, and they just don't know problem solving anymore, um, you know. And so we get these issues of bullying in schools, in elementary school and all that. People, we just don't allow that possibility. So how can we create that safe place where they can begin to explore these other dimensions of their lives uh, and they know they're part of the narrative and writing a new one for their neighborhood and community? I love that imagery of writing a new narrative. And, and uh, Daniel commented on the chat, 
very important points regarding owning the pond, especially in Stockton, California, which was just voted the most miserable city in the USA by Forbes wow. magazine. So, you know, the kids of Stockton know that, that, that the narrative that others are saying about their city is the most miserable city. Um, so imagine imagine you're, you're talking to some kids, and, and how, what kind of conversation do you even have with them to help them dream? I mean, you, you gave us just a, a little bit of phrasing, but can you unpack it more? How do we help kids really dream and then act in developing a new narrative for a place like Stockton? Well, one is, uh, to give you an example, uh, we went to a, a public school. They actually invited us in. And we did a whole class a semester on the sociology of community youth development. <laughs> you know, that was for the, the principal. But the young people didn't know what that was, but it's, they found they liked the youth development piece, community youth. So we had 25. I, I was one of the resource people, and then we had some of our staff teaching it. And we have someone on our staff who has a doctorate in social ecology, so she was, you know, the, the, the teacher of record. But we, we, they, we said, let's look at your neighborhood. So we did this kind of exegesis of their neighborhood. And then they also did some, you know, you corroborate that with history. They did some homework in the library about the history of their neighborhood, on and on and on. They took it all the way back to the, you know, the, the dinosauric age, you know. And wow. they walked through, and then they found a lot of good issues. I mean, Chap Charlie Chaplin, for some of us who know that name, actually lived in the neighborhood in the turn of the century. So they kind of looked and did some good research about their own community that they, they, they did not know and then kind of told them, okay, well, here we are now. Then we asked them the question, what is your vision for 2020? <laughs> then they, they said, well, it doesn't matter because you won't listen. You know, why should we do this? Wow. Well, we, we, they said, what, we, what would be different? And then we, we had them make a presentation to community leaders, the, the, the conservancy um, organization, um, the planning department, redevelopment, and other organizations in the community and pastors. And when they saw the response of the adults being very positive and actually wanting some more details and some of the ideas they had, they were uh, elated. And then they said, well, then put this in paper. And then they put it on a paper, and they drew a portrait of that vision. They had, we had an artist come in, one of the top graffiti artists in L.A., happened to be married to the, the teacher of record, um, Christian, and helped them put it on a portrait. Well, then when the other leaders began to see that portrait, they said, can you make that into a mural? So then we had four agencies vying, arguing, trying to, they came to World Vision, said, which one, can you tell us which place to put it? Because it's not our vision, it's not our mural, it's the young people. You need to negotiate with the youth on where that mural was going to be. Well, one of the people that heard and saw the, the portrait was a, a principal of elementary school who was always chasing away the young people from her her property, the elementary school, because they were skateboarding, didn't want that. But because of what she saw they were capable of doing, how they articulated it, she became now an advocate for a skate bar, skateboard park, right? Now that mural is up. The young people, he actually contributed $3,000. They raised it in addition to public money to put that mural up there that everyone can see. Now yeah. that's their narrative. That's marvelous. That is what they want to see, and that's what they're holding the adult world accountable to. Yeah. And when the young people are discouraged and disappointed to this day, they walk by there. It was put up a year ago, and they're, they're, they themselves renew their hope that they can contribute to something that will make this a better place, not only for themselves, but for the brothers and sisters, their neighbors, and for other people who will come after them. Yeah. That's owning the pond. That is being part of God's narrative for that nation. Wow. Wow. That's, that's very powerful. Thanks for sharing that, that great case study or story. Um, a couple folks commented on a chat a few minutes ago about um, – it, donors in this process, specifically uh -huh. how we talk with donors both about the problems in our communities as well as the possibilities. And, um, and you know, it, don't we need to kind of talk to donors some about the needs, not just the signs of hope? And folks seem to say yes on the chat, yes, we need to talk about both when it comes to donors. Um, I know some ministries who actually do this sort of uh, – 
exegesis walk that you're talking about with mm-hmm. donors. And it's been a marvelous experience because they, they really get to understand the community a little bit more. So, so you, how do we involve um, and frame all this for those who are supporting and investing in our ministry and in students? Right. And one thing is, um, you know, it's a process. Uh, we can't talk about 2020 vision until some of the fundamental concerns and needs of a young person are addressed. Yeah, yeah. Darren just they had, they had to feel like they are valued and heard because there were a lot of people who didn't even want to participate in that because they just say, well, they had other issues. But eventually, you know, momentum picked up. What I found is when, we, when, when people see the end result and knowing that that's where we're going, to hear the voice of young people speak of their vision or even of the issues they struggle with in their home, the violence Daddy it for you. in their neighbor, in their family, in their community. Yeah. It's their story they're telling. And they're also <laughs> denying the, the challenges and struggles and issues. They are there. They are, they are probably very prominent. You can walk it and see them. Um, but... We're not going to resolve all those issues because they'll be forever throwing money into issues that cannot be resolved by resources alone. It is the community that can do that until we can develop the abilities and for the people themselves to see that they are an asset because young people are always told, shut up, be quiet, come here, and always being told then they never really take them seriously that, wow, I can do something about that. So the, 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 the donor needs to understand the context for sure. Yeah. 30% graduation rate, um, you know, poverty rate. But I also can, when I introduce them to these young people and hear them talk, they're blown away. Yeah. They go, how did you get them there? Where are these young people? I go, they're, they're all there. Young people are angry <laughs> all the time. You know, they're angry. They put on their adults, their family, their parents, but because the world is not the way we told them it should be. And so they're wondering, how do we get there? Well, they, let's give them the opportunity to get there. Yeah. To build on the strengths, that's where we get real transformation rather than keep giving people fish. Yeah, yeah good. Um, <clears throat> here's a question that I'd love for you to answer. Do you do this sort of community assessment or community walk just once? Or do you need to continually assess your community? Hmm. I guess what your answer is going to be, but, but why don't you unpack that a little bit, please? Well, the first walk I do is really, it, it takes time for someone who really t- starts it out. It, you could, well, my, my theory is in two hours, total, a total of two hours, you can tell, get the, a good sense of the history, the challenges, and the future of a neighborhood. Now, you, you have to space that. You have to maybe half an hour walk through a block, come back in the evening, come back from the uh, weekend, you know, because life is different in all those time periods. Um, given the nature of change in the urban environment, it kind of dictates how often I walk. Uh, before, when I was beginning really into this, my neighborhood was really transitory. Uh, I was doing it because I actually would walk to my church. Well, that was almost a weekly basis. Monthly, maybe every two, three months, um, certainly more than once a year. If you're in a rural area, you know, maybe once every year. That's about it, you know. But in, in highly uh, urbanized, um, with a lot of mobility among the population, then I probably need to do that, you know, as frequently as I can um, to just keep on breath. Because, again, the data that people use, the information demographics, are always going to be based on census data. Certainly only it's only two years old. But as we get more into the decade, <laughs> that data is no longer relevant. Yeah. You know, you just or as made, relevant as we want. You just made a comment um, that Darren picked up on the chat. He said um, that great point regarding, or Daniel did, regarding going the walk at different times of the day, night, weekdays, weekends. Can you talk a little bit about that, just how you learn different things about your community at different points of the day? Right. Um, I, when we, I usually do the walk and then training them. It's a good time because usually it's during the day. So it really forces us to look at the built environment and not the people. Um, and then we, when you go back in the afternoon or when kids are getting out of school, the families are coming back from work, 
then we get a better understanding how the people themselves interact with their built environment in a positive or negative or restrictive way. Um, so we're going to see young people coming back from school at a certain hour a day. Well, on the weekends, we can see them, you know, it, how, do they actually come out in the public? Do they hang out in the parks? Where, what's going on when they're not, you know, um, in school or work? Or the interactions between the different groups or types of people? So that's what I want to look at and see. Then once I understand the story, the overall narrative by, through reading the built environment, then I see how it has impact on the lives of the people who live there. Yeah. You know, I, I know one thing that's been really helpful for us just in understanding our community and, and as you talked about the history is also talking to adults who were in high school 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. We've learned quite a bit about our community here in Pasadena um, and some of the racial dynamics and tensions over the last decade by, by talking to adults, too. So, so I was just uh, – alumni of, you know, Pasadena High School have a lot to tell us. Yes. Um, about our community. So um, I, I was thinking about um, this whole issue of engaging with donors, and, and a few folks have mentioned on chat that they have done this sort of walk with donors. Um, are you open to us taking your article and, and you know, handing it to a donor or two or, or a staff member or a volunteer or some, a potential volunteer and doing this sort of walk in our community? Well, I don't think it's just a handling that over. I mean, I think the best way of learning and to appreciate this process is to understand the theory, okay. you know, why we're looking at certain things and some of the assumptions we have, you know, uh, we, our own assumptions. You know, we may, again, the paint job may not, you know, shocking pink may to be shocking to us. You know, we want to mute colors. You know, we see that because some of us are so-called, you know, educated and we appreciate different kinds of music, you know, but it tells us quite a bit. So I think it's rather to talk them through and certainly then give this af afterwards as a maybe a little sheet sheet after they've done right. the walk because they may, they may read it, appreciate it, but not really understand it and work yeah. on that. Okay. Um, uh, but I always want to encourage them, let's build on the strength of a community. Too yeah. often we fall back into being poverty pimps. We yeah, gotta right, how right. Things, how bad it is, and how horrible. And look at this drug addict. Look at what this, you know, this young woman has been, you know, abused in her home. God help us, absolutely. Yeah, and I, Darren's made an interesting point, and and this might be the last thing we talk about together. Um, Darren says, as I put together my slideshow for our banquet, I find myself leaning towards needs and deficits, and I'm struggling to express the potential, or at least the potential of the community. I'm good yes. at talking about the potential of city life. Like, right. We could be good at, at talking about our uh, the great stories of what our ministry is doing, but we're, we're, we're a little bit more blind to the potential in our communities and in our cities. Um, and it is, a, 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 for many, a paradigm shift. Yeah. Um, part of it, it comes from our own Messiah complex. And yeah. I, I'm a, I, I confess, I, I'm there. When I came, you know, educated, trained in youth ministry, you know, I thought, I will bring the message of hope. I'm here. Right. Aren't you glad? Right. You know, and we all know what happened to the Messiah. Um, and I'm still trying to come <laughs> off that experience of crucifixion you know young people can do that very well for you so it's really come in with a humble heart and understanding that god is already at work there you know we cannot be naive to say that it's only when we show up that now the young people know the truth they may be biblically illiterate but they have a theology maybe a little yeah. warped a little bit yeah. limited in perception so we begin to look at, again, I'm looking at the assets, the strengths already. Then all of a sudden, I can begin to see that in the neighborhood. Yeah. You know, I can see, wow, look at this little plant that somebody's growing in their front yard. It takes time to build, to plant something and nurture it and see it and cultivate it. You know, that's a great asset there. Look at how that little old lady takes care of her yard. That's a strength and an asset. Look at how those kids having fun on that corner street. That's a great asset. Let's, let's, let's duplicate that. Let's, let's expand that. Let's be viral about the goodness of this, yard, this community rather than harp how bad it is. 
Great. Yeah, obviously I'm not very passionate about this. No, not, not uh, at all. I, I, that's what excites me. I'm, I'm tired of the pain. <laughs> I'm tired of the hurt. Yeah. I want to change that. I want to be a vehicle for that young person and that family to experience the fullness of God with dignity, justice, peace, and hope. And that, I can, on, that can only happen if they're, they're invited to be a part of a God's narrative yeah. and how that life is lived out for everyone, not just the ones who come into my ministry. Yeah. Wow. Great. Well, Michael, you've given so much to chew on. I, I know you you love going deeper on these topics than we've had the time to in this hour, but nonetheless, you've given us um, a lot of great material to think through. Folks are, are buzzing on the chat about um, about quotes and insights that you shared. So I wanna I wanna close in prayer that God would help us know how to apply all this and. Um, continue to teach us more and allow us to be changed even by our communities instead of Amen. we're the ones who are going to change them. So Exactly. Um, so let me pray. Well, God, I thank you for, uh, for Michael and all that you have shown him and the way that you have worked in him and through him for so many years and in, in countless leadership settings. I pray for every person um, who hears Michael, whether it be today or on a future date, that that you would give us eyes to see our community as you see our community, um, that you'd fill us with compassion, that you'd help us not be blind to the needs, but you'd help us also not be blind to the potential, that you'd help us see the space and the people and the partners um, that, are, that you're already at work in, and you'd show us how to uh, cooperate with you as you release even more potential in our community. Help us be learners um, from others in our community and help us um, just glorify you in the way that we uh, humbly approach others in our communities, not with a Messiah complex, um, but with a, a realization that you're already at work and, um, and you are God and we are not. So please make that very clear to us. We ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.